Hey there, nation, and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Cheapskate, and we are back with another episode of Commander Cheapskate Gaming Reviews. This is the series where we review various products related to the miniatures wargaming hobby. And on today's episode, we are going to review the 9th edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle Rules for Orcs and Goblins. So we'll be taking a look at this 9th edition army book for this army. Now in case you guys are unaware, this is actually a document from the Warhammer Armies Project, which is a blogger site that is ran by Matthias Eliasson. Matthias Eliasson has actually created a bunch of PDFs for 8th edition rules for different factions within the Warhammer Fantasy setting, and that's originally how he started his website. So for example, things like the Armies of Bretonia and Beastmen, for example, they got 8th edition rules updates. Well, he's also created a 9th edition fantasy battle uh, rule set as well, and has made army books for those factions as well, which is all kinds of awesome. So what we're going to do today is go over this Orcs and Goblin army book. We'll talk about the army rules, as well as the different units that you can get for your Orcs and Goblins armies, as well as special characters, magic items, as well as magical spells. We'll also go over the army list and give our overall review of the item as well. Now the best part about this, of course, this is absolutely free to download from his website, so I suggest you go over there and take a look at it too. And at the same time, this will be a much more in-depth look at the product as well, so because I will be putting timestamps down in the description box below, so if you want to see a particular facet or a particular section of this army book, you just can click on those timestamps and get started. So with that being said, let's get this video review on a roll. All right, so the first thing we do, of course, is talk about the units as well as the army rules real fast. So as you can see here, we have a huge amount of units you can choose from in this Orcs and Goblins army book. You guys are actually very spoiled for choices. Um, he's actually brought back a lot of throwback units from previous editions of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. He's also included some Warhammer Age of Sigmar units in this list as well. So this part's going to be quite in-depth. So let's go ahead and talk about it real quick. So let's talk about the bestiary first. So first of all, animosity is still a thing. So because of that, the animosity rules have not changed all that much. In fact, it's still very much a invocative rule of orcs and goblins. It's just one of those things as an orcs and goblin player, you just have to deal with, unfortunately. Actually, not unfortunately. I like animosity. Personally, I think it's really cool because it's uh, narratively very much fits what orcs and goblins are all about. And if you're an orc and goblin player who doesn't like animosity, well then, I'll let you something else. And that's just my opinion on it things. So we have our animosity test that still remains the same. Um, goblins still fear elves uh, from high elves, dark elves, as well as wood elves causing fear against them as well. So that's still a problem for a lot of goblin players so they still have to worry about that. At the same time we have the chopper rules. The chopper rules actually got changed a little bit. The strength bonus that you get from a chopper rule now applies it looks like to the entire um, part of combat so it doesn't just start in the very first round anymore. Looks like it lasts the entire time. However, you cannot use this, you cannot use parry special rules if you're using two hand weapons with the Chapa rule. But then again, orcs and goblins are not about uh, defense, they're all about offense, so that's interesting. Size matters is also still a real rule, so snutlings and goblins are treated as expendable, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. And then, of course, we have our green skin races rule. This is a brand new one that's been added to this edition. It states character may only join units of the same race, such as orcs, savage orcs, black orcs, goblins, forest goblins, or night goblins. Black orc characters may still join units of orcs, however. In addition, you may not field a special or rare unit, except black orcs, belonging to one of these races without fielding at least one character or core unit of the same race in your army. So they actually have included that now part. So, I don't know about that. I don't know if I agree or disagree with this green screen races thing. And the reason why is because it's orcs and goblins. I mean, these guys aren't exactly the most unified or disciplined or organized group of people on the on the, on the planet of Warhammer. You know, they just kind of mob up and just go at it, so eh, there's that rule there. Also, we have a new WA miscast table now. So because of that, instead of normally on the normal miscast table, we have the WA table, we have Z Zap for one, uh, two to three. It says, uh, resolve the effects that Sham had cast the Gaze of Mark spell and then deduct D3 dice from your power pool with the Yurk spell. The uh, Shaman is treated to have Frenzy and Stupidity special rules for the rest of the game. Although he may never lose his Frenzy, he may cast no further spells this turn. 6 to 7 is the I Forgot uh, special rule. The Shaman may not cast this spell for the rest of the game. In addition, the resulting Brainstorm permanently reduces his Wizarding level by 1 to a minimum of 0, and he may not cast any further spells this phase. 
Uh, 8 through 9 is Miedertz, all green skins, friends of foe within 12 inches that are capable of channeling power or dispel dice suffer a strength 4 hit which ignores armor saves. In addition, d6 dice are lost from the pool. 10 to 11 is I think I'm gonna. The shaman suffers a strength 10 hit and all green skin units, friend or foe, within 12 inches suffer d6 strength 5 hits which ignore armor saves. In addition, d6 dice are lost from the pool. And then my personal favorite, Edbang. Place the large template over the shaman before removing him from play. Any model under the template must pass a toughness test or also be killed outright with no armor saves allowed. In addition, d6 dice are lost from the power pool. So this is actually kind of cool because we actually see this miscast table from the older editions of Warhammer Fantasy and they actually brought it back for this one, which is absolutely awesome. So let's go ahead and talk about our rules real quick. So first of all, we have orc bosses. Orc bosses have relatively stayed the same. Um, as you can see here, they still have the wall ability, so that's still there, so not much change has happened. We also have our Orc Shamans now, and Orc Shamans use the spells of the Big Wall. Um, and the reason why I'm bringing that up is because there's also been changes to the magic rules for this army, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. So he is going to limit those spells again. Then we have, of course, Orc War Chanters, which is a brand new unit to this edition of Warhammer Fantasy. It's a unit that's been found in Warhammer Age of Sigmar. It's got movement 4, weapon skill 4, 3 ballistic skill, 4 strength and toughness, 2 wounds, 3 initiative, 2 attacks, and 8 leadership. It's got the choppas as well as the size matter special rule, and they have frenzy of violence. Any orc unit joined by a war chanter may reroll once to hit and to wound in close combat. So a little bit of a buff for your lower weapon skill orcs. So that's actually cool. Then of course we have our orc boys. Um, same rules have applied to them. Not much has changed there. We also have our Erebors as well. Same thing matters to them. Now, biggins have changed just a little bit now. So let's go ahead and talk about that real quick. So they get plus one to their weapon skill and plus one strength. So they're still there. And it says several units, orcs and goblins may have option to be upgraded biggins. You may include up to one unit, two biggins for each war boss of the same race in your army. The characteristics above are used for all biggins and replace the unit's normal characteristics. So once again, we have that biggins upgrade we can still use. Then we have Orc Boar Boys. Orc Boar Boys, as you can see here, have remained exactly the same with their Tusker Charge, so not much change has happened there. Same thing with your Orc Chariot, that still remains the same for the most part there. And now, of course, we have a brand new unit now called Orc Brutes. Uh, Brutes are from Warhammer Age of Sigmar. Let's talk about these guys real quick. Movement 4, Weapon Skill 4, Blizzard Skill 3, 4 Strength and Toughness, 2 Wounds, 2 Initiative, 2 Attacks, and 7 Leadership. They have the Animosity, Choppas, and Size Matter rules, and we have a new special rule for these guys called Duff Up the Big Thing. Orc Brutes may reroll failed to hit rolls against monstrous infantry, monstrous beasts, monstrous cavalry, as well as monsters. So these are the ones that go after your, well, big targets, for lack of a better word. And same thing with Gorgruntas. Gorgruntas are also in this army as well. These are from Warhammer Age of Sigmar. Same stats for the Brute. The Grunta itself has Weapon Skill 3, 4 Strength, 5 Toughness, which gives the unit Toughness 3. 3 Wounds, 3 Initiative, 3 Attacks, and 4 Leadership. It's Monstrous Cavalry. It's got the Animosities, Choppas, Duff Up, the Big Thing Rules, Size Matters, Natural Armor, as well as Tusker Charge. So very, very brutal for that creature as well. Now moving on to Savage Orcs. So now we have Savage Orcs, of course, with our big bosses. We got our war bosses and big bosses. They still got the Choppa, Frenzy, Size Matter, Wall Rules, as well as War Paint. And War Paint, of course, is a six support save still. So no change there. There has been a slight change for Savage Orc Shamans. And the reason why is, like I said before, these guys use spells of the Savage Wall. So like I said before, there's been some major changes to the magic rules for this army. So now Savage Orcs have their own spell lore called the Savage Wall, and that's exactly the same spell that they use. So pretty interesting there. And of course, we have our Savage Orcs. They have remained exactly the same. Uh, for the big stab rule, of course, we have those. They cause D3 impact hits with multiple D3 wounds. So that's also really cool because they can charge into things as well. So you might want to have that in your army as well. And you can also purchase multiple big stabbers depending on the number of orcs that are in that unit. So very cool there as well. And of course we have our Savage Orc Boar Boys. They have not changed at all. So they're pretty much still the same there for that unit as well. So now we move on to Black Orcs. Um, Black Orcs still have the Arm of the Teeth rule. They still have the immunity to psychology. As you can see, they're not affected by animosity. In fact, when we go to the war bosses, the big bosses, the quill animosity rule has still remained the same, causing d6 hits. So because of that, uh, that hasn't changed very much at all. And of course, now we move on to our goblins now. So goblin big bosses have remained relatively the same, so no change there. 
Same thing with our shamans now. Now our shaman have changed slightly because their spells for the little wall has changed significantly. Uh, like I said before, we now have individual magic lores for the different races of goblins and orcs and goblins in this army. So that's the reason why there's a little bit of a change there as well. So of course we have our goblins. Now they did kind of change up, oh no, sorry, they didn't change the goblins too much. I apologize, I'm getting my rules mixed up. So we still have our goblins. They have their animosity as well as their fear tests that they gotta take against um, elves. And now we have a new IO unit called Goblin Jesters. These are upgrades to your guys' uh, goblin units. Not such great, great or not such great stats, but the thing that you want to have them for, though, however, is their abilities they give. Goblin Jesters uh, give plus one leadership bonus to their units, so that's actually kind of cool as well. On the downside, however, goblins are always distracted by Jesters, so every turn the unit passes its animosity test, roll another d6. On a roll of another one, the unit is wrapped with laughter and may not do anything for the rest of the turn. As Jesters are so energetic in battle, it's almost impossible to hit the blighter in combat. Enemies must reroll successful two hit rolls against them in close combat. At the start of each round of close combat, which a goblin jester is involved, roll a d6 and consult the table below. We have the oh dear rule when you roll a one. The unit the jester is attached to suffers minus one to hit in close combat this turn because they're too busy being distracted. On a five to three, uh, two to three, nothing happens. On a four to six, though, you have the you annoying little and all enemy units in base contact with the jester's unit is suffering minus one to hit in close combat this turn, and this has no effect on units with immunity to psychology. So, once again, the little annoying little creature that can cause a lot of problems. And this is actually from, I think, Warhammer Quest? I think is where this one comes from, from the older editions of Warhammer Quest. So it's kind of neat to see this uh, unit be brought back. And then, of course, we have Nasty Skulkers. Now, Nasty Skulkers have actually gone through a major change. Originally, Nasty Skulkers were hidden in Goblin units, kind of like Fanatics. But that is no longer the case. So let's talk about these guys real quick. So they're movement 4, weapon skill 3, strength 3, toughness 3, 3 initiative, 6 leadership. They have the Animosity and Fear Elves rules, but now they have Skirmisher special rules as well as Scout special rules. Nasty Skulkers have the Always Strike First and Armor Piercing special rules in terms that they successfully charge enemy in the flank or the rear. And then we have the new Puffball Smoke Bomb. At the end of any close combat phase in which a unit of Nasty Skulkers takes place, they may choose to use their Smoke Bombs. On a 4+, the unit may disengage the combat by making a flea move. If they do so, the enemy cannot pursue them and they will rally automatically in their next turn. So, very interesting right there. You could actually use these for as War Machine Hunters, which is actually kind of cool. So I like that new update for the Nasty Skulkers. That's actually pretty cool. Then of course we have Goblin Wolf Riders. They have remained unchanged. So not much to, the, to talk about there. Same thing with Wolf Chariots. Uh, they remain unchanged for the most part as well. But um, we'll talk about a little bit a little bit more about Chariots later on when we actually get to the special characters. But there's actually a, kind of a neat trick I realize what you can do with Chariot units now. And we'll, we'll talk about those here in a second. Then of course we have our Rock Lobbers for our War Machines. Those have remained unchanged. So not much changes gone there. Same thing with Spirit Chuckas. Do exactly the same thing as bolt throwers, so not much has changed there as well. Doom Diver Catapults. Now, Doom Diver Catapults have been nerfed a little bit. So, uh, the rules for the Doom Diver Catapult still operates exactly the same way. The major difference, though, is that their strength hits they used to do, you, know, you weren't able to take armor saves against their hits. Now, that's not the case. It's just a base strength 5 d6 hits all it is so they did nerf the goblin doom diver and when you combine with the fact that you can only take one until you get the 3,000 points is another nerf with it because balance which i don't understand because this is a stone thrower anyways but there you go so they've actually nerfed the doom diver catapult a little bit which is actually kind of sad to see i really like those doom diver catapults and fighting against them also was also a nice challenge which i thought was kind of nice now moving on from there, we got Night Goblins. So these guys have actually had some different uh, different units added to them. So let's go and talk about those guys real quick. So um, Night Goblin War Bosses and Big Bosses have made the same. Same thing with Shamans. Um, their Magic Mushroom abilities have changed slightly on this one. So let's go and talk about that real quick. So it says, uh, this adds D6 to the casting result. This dice does not count as power dice and they cannot contribute to unlimited power. However, if you roll a one on this dice, you must roll a further D6. On a four plus, nothing happens. But on one of the three, the mushroom was poisonous and the shaman suffers a wound with no armor saves allowed and the spell automatically fails. And the reason why the magic mushrooms have changed a little bit is because magic overall has changed in this edition of Warhammer Fantasy. At the same time as well, we also have access to the spells of the Bad Moon, so now they have their own unique spell system for them, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the magic uh, portion of this book. 
So for Night Goblins, of course, they have not changed at all for the most part. They're pretty much the same. Netters, however, have taken a huge hit with the nerf with the nerf bat. Originally, when you had netters, you could actually have minus one strength to the attacks coming against you, but now it's absolutely changed. Let's go ahead and talk about that real quick. It says unit night goblins may be upgraded to include one or more models of netters. This represented by including one or more netter models in the unit. Netters are equipped and may fight like the rest of the unit. At the start of each round of close combat, the netter must attempt to entangle one of the enemy units they are fighting in their front arc. Roll a d3 for each rank of five or more models in the unit. The result is the number of enemy models in the fighting rank has become entangled. However, for each natural one roll in the dice, the netters have managed to cast the nets amongst their own ranks and entangle their own instead. A model that has been entangled suffers a minus one penalty through their attacks until the end of the close combat round. So now it's the lack of attacks rather than lack of strength, which, you know, give or take, it kind of depends on how you want to look at it. I liked it better when it was minus one strength just because that's just my opinion, but there you have it. Now, Fanatics. Fanatics have also been nerfed a little bit as well um, for their attacks. Before, it was uh, 2D, uh, 2d6 strength 5 armor piercing 1 hits now. So originally, it was um, no, it was uh, no armor saves whatsoever, but they give you that minus 1 armor piercing hit instead. So there's that. And at the same time, though, you can also upgrade with your Thwacker Weezer Puff, Mush Puff Shrooms, which is actually from the uh, Warhammer Age of Sigmar. So now we have that instead. Uh, instead of uh, replaces to save your strength five hits, it says all models hit must pass a toughness test or suffer a wound, which ignores armor save. So you could do that if you want to get your ignore armor save rule back. This has no effect on a mana construct, however. So in addition, all models in the six inches of fanatic with this upgrade count as being in soft cover. So that's kind of like a tactical choice uh, for your thwack weezer puff shrooms if you want to use those for your army as well. Now, we have a new unit now called Go Night Goblin Squid Hunters. So these guys are back from the 4th edition of Warhammer Fantasy. Um, for the 4th edition of Warhammer Fantasy, um, they originally were armored clubs and nets. So let's go ahead and talk about that real quick. The nice thing about these guys is that they have immune to psychology. So not scared of anything. Which makes sense since you're hunting down squigs all day and night. And they're also scouts as well as skirmishers. So it says hunting teams. The model and unit of Night Goblin Squid Hunters may be armed with a number of different weapons. This is represented by including one or more models with that weapon in the unit. If the unit includes nets, the unit follows the rules for netters. If the unit includes clubs, all models fight with a plus one strength in close combat. If the unit includes prodders, all models gain fight an extra rank uh, one special rule. So we do have those rules, which makes them really good weapon hunters, uh, war machine hunters. Especially since you got that scouts rule, which is actually kind of nice. So kind of a nice addition added to the night goblins. And of course, we have our Night Goblin Squig Herds. Uh, those have relatively remained the same, so we're not going to go over that too much. Um, they do have immunity to psychology rules, though, which is actually kind of cool. So you don't have to really, really worry about them being afraid of elves anymore. And of course, we have our Squig Hoppers. And once again, Squig Hoppers have their immunity to psychology. And their random movement now is no longer 2d6, it's now 3d6 for the random movement. So it makes them much faster, which is kind of nice. And then, of course, we now start seeing some ninth, uh, some Age of Sigmar units. We have Night Goblin Sneaky Snufflers. These guys are from the Age of Sigmar. So as you can see here, they got pretty mediocre stats. They also have immunity psychology as well, which is nice. And they also have the skirmish rules. But that's not the reason why you take them. You take them because of the Mooncap Mushroom special rule. It says, at the start of your movement phase, you may, can say that this unit is harvesting Mooncap Mushrooms. If you do so, it cannot move in that movement phase, but you can roll a d6. On a 2+, plus, pick a friendly Night Goblin unit within 6 inches of this unit. That unit gains the Frenzy special rule until the start of your next turn. So that's the reason why you take these guys in order to buff up your Night Goblins. Makes them a little bit deadlier in close combat, which is actually kind of interesting. And of course we have our Great Cave Squigs. These were the character mounts that we had before with D3 random movement, immunity to psychology. And of course you can't have them be in a unit unless they're in Squig Hoppers. So we do have that unit there. And of course we have our Mangler Squigs. Mangler Squigs have remained relatively unchanged for the previous uh, edition, so we're not going to spend too much time on them. But they are they make a uh, comeback. And then we have a couple new units. We have the Night Goblin Squig Gaba. That's a new uh, creature that we have here. It's a monstrous beast. Um, tied down rule attached to it. Which says the Squig Gobla cannot move after it's been deployed except pivoting on the spot. It may not pursue an enemy it defeats in combat. If the Squig Gobla breaks from combat, it is automatically destroyed. The Squig Gobla may fire the shooting phase as long as at least one Night Goblin tender remains with it and not in close combat. When firing the Squig Gobla, roll a 3d6 and consult the table below. So this is what we have for our different shots that we have. 
so it is kind of random. So on a total of one through four, every model within six inches of the Squid Goblin, including Night Goblin Tenders, takes a Strength 2 hit, which ignores armor save. Five to seven is Stomach Rumblings. Nothing happens this turn, but you must instead roll 46 when firing the Squid Goblin next shooting phase. On an eight through 16, we have Squid Torrent. This is resolved as a shot from a stone thrower that uses the large template with a range of 36 inches. Any model covered by the template suffers a strength 4 hit. If it misfires as well, the squid goblin suffers d3 wounds and the shot is wasted. And then 18 plus, 17 to 18 plus, we have intestinal explosion. The squid goblin immediately makes a breath weapon attack at strength 6. After the attack has been resolved, the squid goblin suffers d3 wounds. So it is kind of a tactical decision for you to take this or not because it is kind of short range and once you deploy it, it really can't move. So there is that you can think about as well. So this is more like a defensive measure in my opinion, but if you're night goblins and you're fighting defensively, something clearly has gone wrong. All right, so now we have Colossal Squig. That's a new unit from the Forge World that's actually now in this one. It's got 46 random movement, four weapon skills, seven strength, five toughness and wounds, three initiative, five attacks, three leadership. It's a monster. It's immune to psychology. We have the fall apart rule. When a Colossal Squig is moved as a casualty, every model in base contact with it suffers an automatic strength, three hits. And then we have Dinner's Dinner. When the Colossal Squig's random movement brings it into contact with a unit, whether friend or foe, it will attack it normally as if it were an enemy and counts as charging that unit. This combat will continue until resolved normally. These appalling creatures are too dull-witted and hungry to care otherwise. So we do have that for your monsters, the Colossal Squig, which is absolutely terrifying looking. So continuing on from there now, we have a brand new race that's added to this. Forest Goblins are back. Forest Goblins are from the older edition of Warhammer Fantasy Battle, and they make a comeback in this ninth edition. So you guys are kind of spoiled for choices on this one. So of course we have our Forest Goblin bosses, pretty mediocre stats because they're goblins. They still fear elves, so they still have to worry about that. Now, Forest Goblin Shamans, however, have a new spell that they can use called Spells of the Spider God. So now they have that spell rule that they can use for them, for their lore. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the magic phase. And of course we have Spider Venom. It says Forest Goblin Shamans may reroll one die except ones when casting spells. However, if they roll a miscast, they must also count as having failed a stupidity test if they manage to survive it. So we do have a little bit of buff when it comes to their magical abilities. Now, Forest Goblins, of course, have remained pretty much the same as normal goblins, except they have the Forest Strider rule, so there we have that. And of course, we have Forest Goblin Spider Riders. They have remained relatively the same, so we're not going to talk about that too much. Uh, just know that, you, of course, you have that ability for them. And of course, we have Gigantic Spiders, which are the monstrous beast mounts for uh, hero characters. Those have remained relatively the same as well. And of course, we have the dreaded Agnarok Spiders. And surprisingly, they're actually still the same for the most part. Not much has really happened to them. Their Venom Surge is actually still pretty good. Same thing with their Flinger and their Catch Whip Spider Shrine. So not much has changed for those guys, which is actually kind of nice to see on that one. Now, Snutlings. Let's go and talk about these guys, of course. We have our Snutlings with their horrifically, <laughs> their horrific, uh, their horrific stats. But they do have Exploding Spores, so they can still use that autonomatically. It ignores armor saves, so that's actually kind of nice. It automatically hits, and it automatically uh, it ignores armor save. So <laughs> it'd actually be kind of interesting to see what happens if you actually take your uh, Snutlings and actually have them open fire on a steam tank. You could actually kill that pretty quickly if you roll enough sixes, which is actually kind of cool if you think about it. And of course, you have Snutling Pump Wagons. Now, Snutling Pump Wagons have been nerfed. Um, a little, they have been nerfed. I'm just gonna straight that out and say that. The reason why is because it's not so much of their stats that's changed, it's that they're rare choices now, which means you can only take one Snotling Pump Wagon in your army, unless you go to 3,000 points, in which case you can take two at that point. And like I said, I disagree with that, with that whole rule change, but you know, there's the breaks on 9th edition, so there you have it there. So those have stayed the same, we're just gonna pass back up. And we have trolls now. Of course, our trolls remain the same for the most part. We have river trolls, still disgusting, still cause problems. We have stone trolls, they do exactly the same thing, still cause problems as well. <laughs> Those things are absolutely crazy. They have magic resistance to 5 up armor saver stone trolls. River trolls have uh, minus one to hit against, and also they have river strike rules. And we have the new Dankhold Troll, which is actually from Warhammer Aegis Sigmar. So let's go ahead and talk about that a little bit. So a Dankhold Troll is uh, movement six, three weapon skill, one ballistic skill, 
because it's not shooting. Seven strength, six toughness and wounds, one initiative, six attack, six leadership, and is a monster from the Night Goblins. Magic resistance, three up, four up regeneration save, as well as stupidity rules. We have copious troll vomit. Instead of attacking normally, the model can choose a vomit on an enemy and inflicts D6 automatic strength, six hits with ignore armor save. So, hooray, we got that one. And of course, we have the giant river troll hag. So that's a new character that we have for this army as well, a new monster. This is from Forge World as well. Its stats are actually pretty good. Five movements, three weapon skills, six strength, five toughness, six wounds, one initiative, six leadership, and now we have special attacks for it. So just like a giant, it's got special attacks. It's also a wizard. Level one wizard with the lore of death. It's got Marsh Strider, regeneration of four up, river strider. We have Swamp Breath. This is a strength three breath weapon, which ignores armor saves. A unit that takes casualties from this attack also suffers minus two to its leadership until your next turn, which makes absolute sense. And of course we have Waterwise, unless she's within a water feature of any type, the Troll River, Giant River Troll Hag has Stupidity Special Rule. If the test is failed and there's a water feature on the table, the Troll Hag moves towards it instead of straight forwards. We have Slimy Shanks, enemy is intended to attack a Giant River Troll Hag in close combat, so minus one hit to the hit rolls. And of course we have our um, special attacks. It says, determine what happens in each close combat effects. Pick a unit and base contact with a tr troll hag and roll a d6 on one of the following tables. Which table you use depends on the size of the troll hag's victims. If you're fighting infantry, cavalry, war beasts, or swarms, you get the tiddler's table. And the results, of course, are stuck out and it's, uh, stuck out its marrow, pick up and crush with stump and grind its bones. And then we have the whopper's table. Use this when fighting monsters, monstrous beasts, monstrous infantry, monstrous cavalry, and chariots, war machines, and shrines with a large target special rule. We have Smother, Mother, and Mither. So for Smother, the target suffers D3 wounds, which ignores armor saves. This has no effect on animatic constructs. In addition, the target may not make any attacks until the troll hag is either slain or rolls a different result on its special attack table. We have Mother. The target takes a single strength six hit with a multiple D3 wound special rule. If the target survives the attack, it may not attack until the start of your next turn. We have Mither. Neither the troll hag nor the target actually fight that they have already done so this round. The troll hack automatically wins the combat by two points or more. This result has no effect against MA constructs. And the target has his weapon skill reduced to one until the end of the next turn. This has no effect on animated constructs. So pretty powerful there. Then we have, of course, suck out its marrow. The unit suffers D6 strength five hits. For every wound the target loses, the troll hag gains one up to its starting number. We have crush with stump. Models in base contact, friend of four will suffer a strength six hit. And then we have grind its bones. The troll hag may target a single model in base contact. The model suffers a single strength six hit with D3 multiple wounds special rule as well. And of course we have the pickup and and these are relatively say the same to the um, to the what the 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 the, the, uh, the giant can do. So we're actually not gonna you know talk about that one too much in detail. And of course, giants are back once again as monsters. So as you can see here, we have our monster with our background information as well. They have remained relatively unchanged, so we're not going to talk about that too much. And then of course, we have our new rogue idol of Gork, which is a new monster. This is from Forge World. It's got six movements, weapon skill three, seven strength, six toughness, six wounds, one initiative, four attacks, leadership eight. It's got the automatic construct rule, impact D6 rule, natural armor of two up, and it's also unstable. And we have the special rule, the biggin. If it is possible for a rogue idol to charge an enemy, it must do so. However, if multiple targets are within charge range, its player may pick which to attack. At the start of any turn that a rogue idol is not able to charge or is not able and already in combat, its player must roll a d6. On a roll of one, it must instead charge a friendly unit, uh, sorry, a friendly unit if one is available to charge, and a single round of combat is fought as normal. After which, the rogue idol is pushed one inch back if the charge unit does not break. If no friendly units are available to charge rogue idol bellows and stomps, but otherwise may do nothing this turn. So if you do bring one of these things, make sure you get it stuck in, because otherwise it's going to really hurt you. And of course, wyverns are back, and not much has changed with wyverns, so we're not going to really spend too much time on those guys. And then we have a new one called Maw Crushers. So these are the guys from the Warhammer Age of Sigmar, as you can see here. They got six movement, five weapon skills, six strength, toughness wounds, two initiative, four attacks, six leadership. They're a monster. They don't fly, but they have the hover special rule. They have D6 impact hits and natural armor save a three up. So very cool that they brought the Maw Crusher or the giant cabbage monster for the uh, orcs and goblins. And with that, that ends the army units. And we're going to go directly now to the special characters. 
So in this section, we'll now talk about the special characters. So first of all, let's go and talk about Gorbat Ironclaw. For the most part, he's relatively stayed the same. They have changed his Morgor, Morglor, the Mangler, a little bit. Uh, Morglor now has always strikes first, causes D3 multiple wounds, and ignores armor saves. So that part's kind of neat. Azhag the Slaughter also makes a return on this one as well. He's changed this a little bit as well with some of his abilities. Uh, first of all, we get on with his uh, Inspiring Presence ability. Maybe roll that dice. It doesn't longer affect animosity, so that doesn't take place anymore there. Uh, his magical weapons basically have uh, re-rolled the failed hit rolls in the first round of combat. He's got his Azag's Art Armor. Uh, gives him a 5 award save. It's also medium armor as well. Now he does have the Demon Staff, so that's a new one that he has as well that gives him plus one to his cast spells. And of course we have the Crown of Sorcery, gives uh, Azag a level two wizard who knows spells from the lore of death. In addition, Azag suffers from stupidity, so we do have a little bit of a change for him, but not much. <clears throat> so brings us to Grimgore Ironhide, uh, the uh, awesome close combat special character. Uh, he's remained relatively the same as well. And of course, we do have the Immortals rule. That one's also stayed the same. His magic weapons, as well as blood for armor, has stayed the same as well for the most part. And then he has a new magic item called Mork's All-Seeing Eye, which gives him a magic resistance one special rule. So that one's kind of nice. Then we have a new character, Garfang Rotgut, the Chieftain of the Black Crag. And he is a throwback character from the older editions of Warner Fantasy. Four movement, weapon skill six, strength five, toughness five, three wounds, four initiative, four attacks, nine, uh, nine in leadership. He's got the Choppas, Hatred Dwarves, Size Matters, and Wasp special rules. And his weapon, Red Fang, uh, gives him plus one attack and plus one to hit in close combat. And the Evil Sun Armor, Heavy Armor and Shield, the armor gives Gorfang the Magical Resistance 2 special ability. So this character makes a comeback as well, which is actually kind of cool to see him. And another throwback character is More Gloom Neck Snapper. This is a Black Orc special character, and he also rides a War Boar as well. Weapon skills 7, 5 strength and toughness, 3 wounds, 4 initiative, 4 attacks, 1 uh, for uh, 9 leadership as well. He's got his uh, choppas, immunity to psychology, quantumosity, and wa special ability. He's a natural leader, so because of that, he must be the army general when he is taken. He also has his magic items, the Yumi Healers, two hand weapons. Whenever Morglum's to hit roll on a six, D6 is higher than the target's weapon skill, the attack will not only hit regardless of the score normally needed to hit, but will also be multiplied at two hits. And we have Bulak's uh, bloody armor. That's heavy armor. This armor gives Morgloom the ward save 4 plus special rule. However, if he rolls a 1 when rolling the ward save, the number of wounds suffered is doubled as the bitter spirit of Bulak takes his revenge. So we do have some, uh, you know, risk benefit with this character as well. Then we have Warzag Ud Ura Zabuhu, uh, Z uh, Zahubu, sorry. He's back again, uh, the Savage Orc Shaman. He is back as well. He's relatively main the same, so we're not going to spend too much time on that. Then we have Ground the Paunch. So once again, Ground the Paunch also makes a return as well. He's got Niblet, which is the Arsel, the army's battle standard bearer. He's also got a five up armor save because of the chariot. He's got pulled by three giant uh, wolves. He's also got regeneration five, four up. He's also uh, has to be the army general as well. They kind of change his rules up a little bit. It says you may not include any orc, savage orc, or black or lords if Grom is your general. All in an army containing uh, Grom must include at least one unit of goblins. This one I'm kind of upset with, just because, yes, he's a goblin, but he's also a very powerful goblin to the point where other orc leaders follow him. In fact, one of his characters from the narrative, anyways, Blacktooth, who's a savage orc shaman, he's a lord character, rides a wyvern, so I disagree with that rule, but there you have it. Uh, he's also got Eat Elves for Breakfast. It says, as long as Grom is alive, all units in the army ignore Fear Elves special rule. And also Grom, he also causes a wild ability of his own. So he gets plus one resolution for that as well. His magic items are Axe of Grom, gives him Killing Blow and a five up uh, for um, against Elves. And he's got the Luggate Matter, which gives him a five up ward save. Now the nice thing about this character is that because of uh, the way the rules are written, you can actually take your armor save, your ward save, and your regen save as well. So you can do all three, so it makes him very survivable in combat. Not to mention, a lot of people didn't like to take Grom because he was by himself on his chariot. But with the way the rules are written for this ninth edition of Warhammer Fantasy, you could actually put Grom in a unit of goblin chariots, it looks like. So if you're worried about him just being targeted on his own, he could actually be now in a unit of chariots, which gives him a little bit more cover. So that part's kind of cool as well. So. 
yeah, I could definitely see that using Grom and putting in a unit you know, of goblin chariots and just having them just destroy everything that stands in their path. That'd actually be really cool as well. So that's kind of nice to see that taking place. Then of course we have Scar Snook, the World of Eight Peaks. He's remained relatively unchanged, so I'm not going to spend too much time on him. And then we have a new character, the Black Gobo, who is the dreaded nemesis of the White Dwarf. So let's take a look at his stats. He's got weapon skill 6, plus a skill 3, 4 strength and toughness, 3 wounds, 5 initiative, 4 attacks, 7 leadership. He's a Night Goblin special character. He's got the Fear Elves and Surprise special rules. He says, really hates dwarves. The Black Gobo may be able all fail to hit when fighting his dwarves. In addition, the Black Gobo and any unit he accompanies are stubborn when they're in base contacts with any dwarves. He's got the Thaggy Az, which is his magic weapon. And it says, if the Black Goblin scores a hit against an enemy who has a magic weapon, the enemy's magic weapon is destroyed on a roll of 4+. Plus. In addition, the axe confers plus 1 strength and plus 1 attack to the wielder. He's also got the belt buckle of Durzik Aldraz. Forged with runes of good fortune, the wearer of the belt may reroll a single d6 roll once per game that are, uh, affects him directly. We have Got, got Kid's beard. The protective runes within the beard confer a ward save of 6 to the Black Gobo. And then we, of course, have the Hood of Night. The Hood causes Night Goblins to treat the Black Gobo as if he had a leadership of 9. So, kind of cool we see that character being there. Then we have a Savage Orc character named Big Feet Bonehead. I'm not sure if he's from an older editions of Warhammer Fantasy or not, but there you have it. He's here. Uh, weapon skill 5, movement 4, uh, strength of 4, toughness 5, 2 wounds, 3 initiatives, 3 attacks, 8 leadership. He's got the Choppa's Frenzy, Hate the Empire, Special Rules, Size Matter, as well as War Paint. He has Bonehead's Whacker, uh, Grit Weapon. The Whacker gives Bonehead, Big Feet the Always Strike First Special Rule and allows him to re-roll failed to wound rolls. So, that's actually kind of cool. Then we have Borgut Face Beater, another throwback character. is also a Black Orc uh, character. Weapon skill 3, strength of 5, toughness 5, 2 wounds, 3 initiative, 3 attacks, 9 leadership. He's a Black Orc special character. He's got the Choppa's Immunity Psychology as well as Quill Animosity special rules. He's got the Face Beater rule. If, the, if Borgut fights any challenge, then at the beginning of the first close combat phase of the challenge, he can smash his thick Orc skull into the face of his opponent or any monstrous mouth that they may be riding. This is in addition to his normal attacks and is resolved before any other attacks is challenged. If this attack inflicts an unsaved wound, the target is reduced to weapon skill 1 and gains the always strike last special rule for the rest of the close combat phase. If this mighty headbutt kills his opponent, Borgut can make it his remaining attacks to calculate overkill for the purposes of combat res. Then we have uh, keep your enemies closer. If your enemy army includes Grimgor, then you may never deploy Borgut further than 6 inches away from him when setting up your army. We also have to say, do as I say what I do. If Borgut is including your army, then you may upgrade one additional unit of Orc Boys into Bark Biggins. Borgut must deploy and remain with this unit for the entirety of the battle. Then we also have uh, Ard Lad's Axe of Doom. <laughs> it's two hand weapons. Uh, let's see here. It says, this massive axe. Uh, oh, so that's weird. Two, two hand weapons. So I guess it's supposed to be these massive axes. Add plus one to more good strength and always allow him to reroll fell armor saves. And we have Drog Dead Art Armor. Uh, this gives Borgut a plus one armor save that cannot be improved. Well, you got a one-up armor save. I don't think you can improve it. So there you go there. And of course we have Badruk Ed Splitta, the Scourge of the Grey Beards, uh, Grey Dwarves of Karak Norn. That's another uh, Black Arc special character. Four movement, six weapon skill, five strength and toughness, two wounds, three initiative, three attacks, eight leadership. Uh, he's got the Choppa's Immunity Psychology Quilonomasi rules. He's got Executioner Strike. But Drek has a Killing Blow special rule. In addition, he can cause Killing Blows on a Wound Roll 5 up rather than a 6. And then we have Dwarf Trinket, which says here one use only. Uh, once per battle, Badruk can cause one enemy model fighting in close combat to miss with all of his normal attacks. He may wait until after the enemy has rolled to hit to decide to use it, but must choose before he rolls to wound. So we have Gatilla the Hunter. He's back again. Uh, he's remained unchanged, so we're not going to talk about him too much. Same thing with Snaggle Grob Spit, leader of the Death Creepers. He's pretty much the same as well, so we're not going to spend too much time on him either. So with the special characters done with, the next section we're going to talk about now are magic and magic items. Alright, so that takes us now to the magic and magic items of this book. So like I said before, we do have some changes for the spell lores. Uh, they pretty much divide them up between the different races of goblins and orcs that you have in your army. So first of all, we have the spells of the big wall. The power of the wall lore attribute is relatively the same. We also have now Gaze of Mork, which is a direct damage spell, so that's brand new, as well as Wrath of Quark, uh, which is also another 
uh, magic missile spell that they actually had before. Now, Fists of Gork have changed slightly. What it is now, it's a cast on 8-up. It's an augment spell with a range of 24 inches. The target unit gains plus 1 strength until the start of the caster's next magic phase. The wizard can choose to extend this spell to all friendly units within 12 inches for 16-up. Headbutt has remained the same. Same thing with Ear We Go, but now we have a new spell called the Wa. Wa is an augment spell that affects all friendly orc units of any type with five or more models within six inches. The target units will immediately make a move using the random move 2d6 special rule towards the nearest enemy unit within line of sight. If no enemy units are within line of sight, they move directly and forward instead. And of course we have the Foot of Gork, and that spell of course has relatively stayed the same for that one. Now we have a new spell lore called the Spells of Da Savage Wa, and the power of this Da Wa is a lore attribute. For each friendly orc unit within close combat within 12 inches, the shaman adds plus one to his casting roll. Conversely, for each orc unit fleeing within 12 inches of the shaman, he suffers minus one to his casting roll. And we have actually got quite a bit of new spells here. We have Bone Crusher, which casts on a 5-up, Magic Missile, range of 24 inches. The closer the target is to the cast, the more powerful the attack will be. If the target is within 6 inches, it suffers 2d6 strength 5 hits. If it's between 6 to 12 inches away, it suffers d6 strength 5 hits. If it is more than 12 inches away, it only suffers d3 strength 3 hit 5 hits. Then we have Cunning Beast Spears for 5 up. It's an augment spell. Within 24 inches, that targets Savage Orcs. Your opponent must reroll all to hit rolls of 6 that the target of the unit with missile attacks and in close combat to the next uh, casting's magic phase. The wizard can choose to have this spell extend with all units within 12 inches. If they do so, the casting value is increased to 10. Then we have Brutal Beast Spirits for casting a 6 up. It's an augment spell, range of 24 inches. This adds plus 1 movement to any unit that moves and makes and gains plus 1 to hit in close combat until the next magic phase. The wizard can have change all friendly units within 12 inches on 12 plus. Then we have Breath of Mork. Casting spell with 18, uh, augment spell with a range of 18 inches. That targets a single unengaged Savage Orc unit. This unit may immediately make a normal fly move, as if it was the remaining boost phase. The wizard can extend the range of the spell to 36 inches. If so, cast a 9 up. Very nice. We make your Savage Orcs move really, really quickly. Then we have Squiggly Curse for 10 up. Direct damage spell 12 inches. Targets a single enemy model. Uh, I'll roll these six on a one to three. Uh, it has, uh, sorry, on a one, no effect. Two to three suffers one wound. Four to five suffers D6, uh, D3 wounds, and on a six suffers D6 wounds. These wounds have the Ignore's Armor Save special rule. Each time a model is slain by a squiggly curse, you can add D3 to any further casting attempts made by the caster of this magic phase. Then we have Gork's War Cry, cast 11 plus, direct damage spell with a range of 18 inches. Target suffers D6, strength 5 hits, which ignores armor saves, and is stunned by the deafening roar. The target unit you know, halves all their movement and is subject to the Always Strikes last special rule until the start of the caster's next magic phase. This spell has no effect on animated constructs. And of course, level 6 is the Evil Sun, cast in a 14. Magical Vortex. It looks like it can move, uh, travels to any direction, uh, causes everything that gets passed over by a strength 5 hit. So, pretty cool there. Now we have spells a little wah. So, once again, these are your normal goblin spells. Sneaking, stealing, lore attributes are remain the same. Most of the spells have stayed the same with sneaking, stabbing, burst, uh, brain burst, uh, mark, save us, gork will fix it, as well as uh, hand of gork. But now we have a new one called Nick It Nick It with 12 plus. Direct damage spell with a range of 18 inches uh, targets a single enemy character. The target suffers D3 strength 4 hits with ignore armor saves. And the target has one or more magic items. Randomly select one of them. That item is stolen on a roll of a 3 up. If the caster does not already have a magic item of this type, they can now use it. Or otherwise, it is destroyed. The wizard can extend the range of this spell to 36 inches with a 14 plus. And then we have Mork wants you for 13. Direct damage spell with a range of 12 inches that targets a single enemy model. That target must pass a nuisance test or suffer D6 strength 10 hits. The wizard can extend the range of this to 24 inches. If they do so, the casting value increases 16 plus. So very, very cool little assassination type spells in the little wall. And now we have spells of the bad moon. So they still get sneaky stealing. And this is the lore for the night goblins. We have Vindictive Glare, which still stands the same. Night Shroud is still the same. Now we have a new spell called Squiggler. Augment spell that affects units of squigs of any type within 12 inches. The targets may add an additional d6 inches to any non flea move that they make and gain their frenzy special rule to start the next caster's next magic phase. Can extend to 24 inches on a 10 up. We have Inchy Nuisance, which is made the same. We now have the new spell, the Great Green Spite on a 9 plus. Direct damage spell with a range of 24 inches. Pick one friendly goblin unit of any type within 12 inches of the caster. The target suffers d6 strength 4 hits. If this friendly unit has a lower unit strength than 20, 
2d6 strength 4 hits if the friendly unit has a unit strength of 20 to 30. 3d6 strength 4 hits if the friendly unit has a unit strength of 30 to 40. Uh, uh, over 30. These hits have armor piercing special attack rules. So that's what we have there on that one. Which is actually kind of interesting. So, oh well. I guess that's the way it kind of works with these guys. Moving on, we also got uh, Night Shroud, which you got an 8 plus on that one. That one stayed the same. We have Call the Moon, which is a direct damage spell with a range of 18 inches. Place a small template with the center anywhere within the range. In fact, it scatters direct damage like a stone thrower. If a missed fire is rolled, send a template over the caster instead. And of course, we have the uh, the uh, Curse of the Bad Moon instead, so we actually have that, which is actually kind of cool. So we do have that. All right, so moving on, we also now have the spells of the Spider God, which is a new Forest Goblin spells. Uh, they still have Sneaking and Stealing, so they do have that. We have Venomous Spiderlings, which is a signature spell. Direct damage spell with 24 inch range, causes 3d6 strength 1 hits, can extend it to 48 inches. We have Deadly Webbing, uh, with a uh, pick a terrain feature within 24 inches. The target counts as dangerous terrain and the units cannot march while within it. The spell has no effect on Forest Goblins. Can be extended for 48 inches for 11 plus. We have Chitinous Armor, cast on a 6 plus. Augment Spell for 24 inches that attack targets Force Goblins. The target unit gains the Natural Armor 6 special rule, and you can extend the range of 12 all, to all units in 12 inches for 12 plus. Scuttling Terrors on an 8 plus is an Augment Spell of 24 inches, targets Force Goblins. The target unit may immediately make a move as if it were the remaining moves phase. You can also extend the range of 48 inches for 11 plus. Then we have Sneaky Distraction, cast on an 8 plus. Hex spell within units of 12 inches, all units within 12 inches of the caster. Target units suffer minus one to hit with missile attacks and in close combat to the start of the next magic phase. The spell has no effect on models with immunity to psychology. The wizard can choose to extend the range for 18 inches of our 12 plus. We have Curse of the Spider God. Hex range, 24 inches. The target must reroll successful hit rolls and armor saves until the start of the caster's next magic phase. The wizard can extend the range of the spell to 40 inches. If they do so, the casting value is increased to 11 plus. And then we have Gift of the Spider God, which is level six spell, cast on a 12 plus. Augment spell with a range of 24 inches that targets forest goblins. Uh, the target unit gains the poison attacks and regen six up special rules until the start of the master's next magic phase. If the unit already has poison attacks, the spell will boost its venom so that they wound the target automatically on a hit roll of six plus. And the wizard can choose instead to have their spell affect all from the use within 12 inches. If they do so, casting values up to 24 plus. So let's go ahead and talk about magic items now. So we have Battle Axe of the Last Wall for 85 points. It looks like roll d6 at the each round of combat. The wielder of this weapon adds that number to both his attacks and strength. However, the more attacks the wielder makes, the more difficult the axe is to control. Because of this, the standard weapon bearer's weapon skill is lower to an amount equal to the die roll. Oh, pretty rough there. We have Bash's Axe of Stunty Smashing for 50 points. Uh, get Armor Piercing 1, plus 1 attacks and plus 1 strength. And is bonus if you're double, if you're fighting as dwarves. Pretty cool there. We have Armor of Gork, plus D3 Toughness, D6 Impact Hits. That's always a really nice one to have. Especially if you have a character's mount on a chariot. That's actually really cool to use. Then we have Collar of Zorga for 15 points. It looks like uh, requires Hit the Bear if you're wearing that. We have Horn of Urgok for 25. One use only, the horn can be used at the start of any of your turns. When this horn is sounded, all friendly units within 24 inches please see plus one leadership and all enemies suffer minus one leadership. Really, really cool there. I could definitely see that being used, you know, pretty well. Then we have Lunkin' Shrunken Head, plus one of your ward saves, that stayed the same. Skull of Kaloth, 50 points, still remains the same. Mork's Spirit Totem for 60 points, it's a magic standard. Gives you magic resistance D6, pretty cool. And it says, in addition, all magic items belong to enemy models that are in base contact with the bearer do not work and will count as mundane versions instead. That's actually a pretty good one for 60 points. That's actually pretty good. Then we have the Spider Banner for 50 points. Forest Goblin, big bosses only. So only Forest Goblins can take this. Uh, they have poison attacks. If they have poison attacks, I'm not going to 6 up. Then we have the Bad Mood Banner for 40 points for Night Goblins. Uh, makes them stubborn. In addition, the banner shrouds the unit of darkness. Enemy suffers minus one to hit with missile weapons. And any unit he joins. In addition, any enemy models that make charge contact with the bearer or the unit must make dangerous terrain test. Hmm, pretty good for 40 points. Not gonna lie about that. So, those are the magic items as well as the magic spells. So, with that being said, we're now gonna move on to the army list and we're gonna wrap up this review. All 
All right, so the last one we're talking about real quick are the army lists real quick. So let's talk about those. So of course we have our lords, 335 for Gorbad, 460 for Azag, 320 for Gringor, Ra Gorfang is 190, 245 for Morgulum, Next Snapper. We have uh, Warzag, he's 330 points for him. Enemy may, 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 may be mounted on a warboard for 224 points, for 24 points, which is kind of cool. We have Ground the Pond for 240, Scar Snick for 265, the Black Gobo for 170. We have Orc War Bosses for 130. And of course, you got all their different things they can ride Wyverns as well as Maw Crushers, which is kind of neat. And of course, we have uh, Savage Orc War Bosses. They can actually ride Maw Crushers too. Wow, that's pretty cool. So you can also put them on Wyverns too, which is absolutely really cool. So now these guys can actually war ride Minute Monsters now, which is awesome. Black Orc War Bosses. Looks like they can ride wyverns as well, or mock crushers and chariots, or warboards. So nice. So you can actually mount these guys too, which is actually kind of cool for 165 points. Then we have goblin war bosses. They can take goblin chariots or giant wolves. And then all their stats there for 65. Forest goblins are 65 as well. They can either ride giant spiders or gigantic spiders. We have night goblin war bosses. Uh, they can ride ga or great cave squigs for 55. We have Orc Shamans, they can ride Warboars, Orc Chariots now, which is kind of nice. And of course they could always ride Wyverns. Savage Orcs can still ride can ride Wyverns as well, which is great, as well as Warboars. So that's pretty cool there. So not much change there. Let's we'll see your or, uh, Goblin Grey Shamans can ride Wolf Chariots. That's actually kind of nice. And Night Goblin Shamans, they're just still stuck on foot. Forest Goblins, of course, can ride Anorak, uh, Arachnorok Spiders which is kind of nice as well, so that has remained the same for the most part. Now for our heroes, Big Feet Bonehead is 130 points, Borgroot Face Bleeder Be Eater is 170, Bedruck Ed Splitta is 135, looks like Catilla the Hunter is 70, and of course you can upgrade his Wolf Riders. Snaggle Grop Splitter is 90, and once again you can upgrade his uh, Spider Riders. We have Orc Big Bosses. Uh, looks like they can only wear a Warch Boar or Orc Chariot only now for 65. Uh, same thing with Savage Orcs. Looks like they can only ride a War Boar now. They can't ride anything else. Black Orc Bosses can ride either a Chariot or a War Boar. So that's kind of nice there too. And of course, Army Band of Senator Bear for 25 points. We have Goblin Bosses. They can ride Goblin Wolves or uh, Wolf Chariots. Night Goblin Big Bosses are can ride Great Grave Squigs. So it looks like they remain the same too. And then we have Forest Goblin Big Bosses. You could ride Giant Spiders or Gigantic Spiders. And they remain the same as well. So that's actually kind of nice. Now the Orc War Chanter, which is new to this army, can, uh, is for 65 points. And they can also ride War Boars or Boar Chariot, which is kind of neat there too. And Orc Shamans. Uh, looks like they can ride a War Boar, Savage Orcs, War Boar, and Goblin Shaman, Giant Wolf. And then of course you have your Night Goblin Shamans and Forest Goblin Shaman, who can ride a giant spider. So those are your Lords and Hero choices, looks like. So for your core choices, we got seven points for Orc Boys. Looks like they can take Spears if they want to now, which is kind of cool. And of course, it toss two points to upgrade into Biggins, and if they become Biggins, they can take Medium Armor, which gives them five up armor save, which is nice uh, for one additional point, so that's really cool. We have our Orc Arrow Boys. They got seven points. We have Savage Orcs as well. They can take Bows as well as Spears, it looks like. They can also get a Beg Stabber for every 10 models for 20 points. And they can be upgraded at Biggins, and they can take a Magic Center with 50 points as well. And they're worth nine points a piece, so that's cool. Goblins are worth three points per model as always. They can take Short Bows and Shields and Spears, and their Goblin Jester costs 20 points for those guys. Wolf Riders are nine, it looks like they remain the same. Night Goblins are 2.5 per model, looks like. Uh, let's see here. Looks like half point for short bows, half point for spears, light armor for half a point. May include a netter for one point per model and up to three for Nax 25. And of course, they can use that Thwack Weezer Puff Shrooms, and that's an automatic free upgrade. So that's kind of nice. What else do we got? We got uh, for our core units, we have Forest Goblins. Looks like they're 2.5 points per unit. So this is a brand new addition. They have their spears as well as short bows they can take, and they get poison attacks with one point per model. Very cool there. And of course we have Spider Rider, uh, Forest Goblin Spider Riders. They're back with 11 points per model there. And they can also get poison attacks too for one point per model. So that's really cool. And of course we have our Snutlings worth 15 points per base, which is kind of cool. Now onto our special units, we have our Black Orcs, of course. They remain the same for the most part. Boar Boys, you can make them into Biggins now, which is kind of nice. 
and they can also carry medium armor for one point per model. Makes them pretty interesting. Same thing with Savage Orc Boar Boys. Looks like they can be upgraded to Biggins as well. And they can, of course, have their additional hand weapons because they're Savage Orcs, they can do that. And of course, we have our Boar Chariots. So those have stayed the same. Now, this is the nice part about Goblin Wolf Chariots. You can take them in units of one to three. And at the same time, you can also like give them additional wolves, additional crew members, and you can also put Ground the Paunch in them, which is actually kind of cool. So that's really neat. Spear Chuckers are worth 35. Rock Lavas are 85. Uh, Night Goblin Squid Hunters, those are four points per model. And of course, you can either equip them with nets, clubs, or prodders. So that's kind of nice. We have Night Goblin Squid Herds, eight points. It looks like each Squid Herder costs three points per model for every three Cave Squigs. So it looks like you need to have that. Squig Hoppers were 12. They can carry Spears and Light Armor for two points apiece, which is kind of nice. Snaky Snufflers are worth eight points per miniature, so looking at 44 points for a base. Which, considering they give their Night Goblin counterparts frenzy, it's not bad at all. And let's see here, we have Orc Brutes. Uh, those are a new special unit. Those are the guys from Warhammer Age of Sigmar. They can carry great weapons for two points apiece to 18 points apiece. Goblin Nasty Skulkers are worth six points. They can also take throwing weapons. Trolls are worth 37. And if you upgrade into River or Stone, it costs them two points apiece there. Eight points apiece there, I apologize. Now onto our rare units, the Orc Gore Gruntas. Those guys are worth 56 points apiece. You can only have one unit until you take up to 3,000 points. And they can take spears. You've got Doom Diver Catapults, which were 75, which is nonsense that they can only take one until you get to 3,000 points, but that's just me. Plus they netted their, plus they nerfed their uh, armor, uh, no armor save attack. Then we have Snutley Pump Wagons, which I don't get why they're rare. I mean, how difficult is it for Snutlings to build a pump wagon? It's 45 points, so there's that as well. We also got Mangler Squigs, which are 70 points, and Night Goblin Squig Gaba for 100 points. A Colossal Squig is 175. A Dankhold Troll is worth 215. Of course, we have the Ragnarok Spider for 260 with a Flinger for 30. We have a Rogue Idol of Orc for Gork rather for 225 points. And of course, we have our Giant River Troll Hag for 235 points, as well as our giant for 200 points as well actually hold up okay just making sure i was trying to see if the dang cold troll had a great weapon or not so doesn't matter okay just checking there for that as well and there you have you guys that makes up the army list for the orcs and goblins so there you have it folks that is the review for the ninth edition of orcs and goblins army book for warhammer fantasy and then once again this is written by matthias eliason for his warhammer armies project and overall this is a excellent resource extremely well done i do like the graphic design for the uh, book as well as well as a lot of the rules that we have what i really like are the brand new units you can put in there especially from miniatures from warhammer age of sigmar and that's just because i don't play warhammer age of sigmar but for those who do play warhammer age of sigmar i can see that being really useful because then you can use it for both both, both games and since I'm a cheapskate that just appeals to me all kinds just because uh, you know I like using things like proxies and stuff whenever I can and if you can use miniatures to play multiple games um, you have basically achieved the dream as far as I am concerned in being a cheapskate that way and for the fact that this is actually done absolutely free to download from his blog website is even more generous on that fact as well now granted he has nerfed a couple of things within the orcs and goblin rulebook and he's also added that uh, racial discrimination basically for the different goblins and orcs and stuff but there's enough variety and new things that you can add to it that it kind of overshadows that the positives and the benefits of this new army book significantly outweigh the negative effects so that part is extremely cool as well so there you have you guys if you plan on playing some warhammer edition uh, ninth edition warhammer fantasy battle go down to the army armies project uh, blog and you know download this document and use it for your games so that's good for this one, you guys. As always, please feel free to like, comment, and or subscribe. Your guys' input is invaluable to us, as always. Also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the latest, greatest hobby news related to our channel. That's good for this one, you guys. We'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace out and stay classy.